Thank you. Yeah. So that's, it's, it is actually a nomenclature that was introduced to, at least the first time I heard it was from Steve Benner, who's a chemist. And he says, if you take all the ingredients that you think are necessary for life, you put them in a pot and you stir it together, you get tar. And, that, and, and he says that's a tar paradox. Um, it's one of the many things that Christine said I've been gathering and listening to everybody. It's a surprise I haven't actually exploded from trying to integrate all this information. But um, so today I'm going to talk about a topic that I've been trying to put together as a bridge between uh, planetary evolution and chemistry over the years. And it's still a work in progress, so I, I, I appreciate your patience in trying to follow my thoughts on the subject. It's not complete. I think that this is going to take a long time to really put it all together. Um, but basically, I, I hope that I can show you a little bit about how uh, geologists, planetary scientists look at planets. And this is a photograph I took uh, a couple years ago in Banff National Park in Canada. And, you know, yes, it's very pretty, of course. Most people would agree. But as a geologist, you look at this and you see so many things that would escape the attention of the average viewer. You know, like the first thing I noticed here was that this big glacial valley that runs along here seems to go right along the axis of where there's layers dipping this way here and this way here. That's part of what makes it pretty. There's a symmetry. But why, does a glacier, why did the glacier choose that place to run along and make this valley? It's not a coincidence. This is what we often see. Um, but there's all sorts of things going on here. Of course, we see rocks eroding, and then we see that broken up rocks being exploited by plant life, which is stabilizing these slopes. We see there's all sorts of things. I, I could go on forever, but I have to get to this talk. What I'm going to argue today is that the planet runs on catalysis, that that Earth's systems are intertwined and interdependent, and that without catalysis, a lot of them wouldn't operate. And that's a collective sort of behavior. And it has a lot of implications. So take these four planets, terrestrial planets in our solar system, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. Um, think about some of their characteristics. Um, do they have a magnetic field? Mercury, Earth, yes. Venus, Mars, no. Although we think Mars had one in its early history. It doesn't anymore. Uh, the only one that has standing surface water that we can look at is Earth. Um, actually, at least three of these are volcanically active. Mercury was volcanically active before, but not so much today. Um, plate tectonics. We know Earth has plate tectonics. Maybe Mars did in the past. These other guys don't, don't seem to have much evidence for it, but that's still debated. Um, and, of course, abundant life. We look at Earth, we can tell that there's living things there. Uh, Mars, we've been digging and poking around for a while. We haven't found life yet. Maybe it's buried somewhere, but it's not that uh, abundant. Contrast this to stars. Stars, we have this beautiful Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And uh, this is something that uh, is, a, is really a great triumph of uh, astrophysics. On the vertical axis, it's kind of cut off here. This is the luminosity, and then you have the, the color, the temperature, on the horizontal axis. And the majority of stars fall in this main sequence, and this is very well understood in terms of uh, the, the generation of the star and also the, the pathway it falls as it undergoes fusion reactions and changes composition through time. Um, Stars are driven by abundant energy. They have tons of energy because of, of the fusion reactors that are operating in their centers. And catalysis is not so important. They're just blasting energy, and they're driven to have the same or very similar behaviors. You can cluster them and understand what's going on pretty well. Terrestrial planets, on the other hand, are capable of expressing vastly more degrees of freedom. They don't have that much energy. They're not just being overpowered by this huge uh, energy source. So let's look at the surface of the sun. This is a new movie that just came out from this solar telescope in Hawaii. It's a very, uh, you, guys, you can watch this all day, I think. One of these convection cells is supposed to be about the size of Texas for scale. Maybe that's Japan there and California here. 
So this is what's going on. Stars are just being overpowered, driven really hard by these fusion reactions in the middle. Um, there's not much that remains there. Like, you observe it for a little while, and anything that used to be there is gone. It's, it's constantly uh, tearing everything up. Whereas planets, and one of the reasons we send these robots to Mars is that there's a lot of stuff to go around and look at that's left behind for billions of years. When we go to Mars, we can actually look at rocks from the very, very early solar system. So there's memory. Geology on a terrestrial planet is possible because the past processes leave behind a record that you can go and look at and then say something about what happened there. Um, the other thing that planets do is exhibit hysteresis. And hysteresis is, I'm going to get really deep into this, um, is that sometimes the past processes that were operating on the planet change things in a way that alters their future behavior, right? So you change the rules of the game. You're rigging the system. And planets do that. Terrestrial planets do that. And you see that all over the place in this image. This is just another example of memory and processes and all these interactions. This is another place. This is actually a little to the north of where I took the other photo. There's a glacier coming down here. You know, geologists can go and see all these various characteristics and understand what's going on there and piece these together in terms of past processes and history. Um, and this is what we're trying to do. So what I want to ask here is, is the diversity of terrestrial planets and, and moons, I'll, I'll be happy to include terrestrial moons in the, in the discussion, is it deterministic? Are there catalysis-like factors that play an important role in shaping them? Or do you just kind of throw everything that's supposed to become a planet into a pot, stir it up, and then get a, an answer that we can predict? This has a lot of implications for characterizing exoplanets and the observations we're making with astronomy in the coming years, uh, origins of life and habitability, and the way we think about all of these things. Um, we ask the same thing about, for example, this TRAPPIST-1 system we've been observing, which is not far from the sun. Uh, there's all these planets. Of course, we haven't actually seen them. This is the artist rendering. Um, it's a very small system. It all fits in this little box here, way inside the orbit of Mercury. Um, but it's the question, can we understand these in terms of, even if I give you the bulk composition and radius, away from the, the, the host star, TRAPPIST-1, and luminosity, can you tell me what it is and what it's about and what that planet looks like? Um, or is it, are, are the planets shaped by processes that breed distinct outcomes and in individual character that are more or less impossible to predict? Um, so let me go back to some basics, because I think that if we're going to discuss something that, that's really stretching the ideas and the language that people apply to chemistry, I think we should start from something that maybe we kind of agree on. Um, what are the assumptions and conditions that are necessary to underpin precise definitions of things like catalysis? Um, how can the concepts be generalized? And is the loss of precision that we have accompanying our broadening of the, the use of this language uh, worth the gain and insights? Of course, these are all worthwhile questions. I think in uh, freshman chemistry, I learned something kind of like this. There's a reaction. You have a reaction coordinate. You have the reactants and the products. And as you move along here, you have to go through some activation energy hill. Um, after the reaction, you have your original energy plus some delta E. And uh, this activation energy here is what you have to pay to get over this hill. If you have this much available energy here, then you're cool, right? You can go over that hill and get to the other side. But let's say you have this much. Well, then you're not going to go there. What if you have a number of things that are trying to get over these hills, and each of them have different, different energies, E1, E2, E3, E4, E5? This one didn't make it. E1, not enough. E2, oh, it got over the hill. E3, nope. 
E4, no good. E5, oh, that really was bad. These systems can be exchanging energy or deriving energy from some reservoir. How are they distributed? These are all relevant questions. Are there external conditions that excite particular values of these energies that will influence whether it's going to go over the hump? We all learn in basic chemistry that ergodic systems have large degrees of freedom that distribute energy following a Boltzmann kind of distribution. So the distribution of energies is exponential with this factor minus 1 over kT. And um, of course, at higher temperature, you have more states that are abundant at higher energies than at lower T. And you think of them about these states, then these ones are going to have the energy to get over this activation energy, and the other ones aren't. As they do hop over and they do go through the reaction, then other ones are going to slide from lower energies to higher energies. So the rate of processes is going to go in proportion to something like the exponential e minus Ea over kT. So everybody knows this. this is really basic stuff. Then we learned that catalysis is something like this, something that takes this activation energy barrier and it lowers it. Again, apologies if this is like overly simplistic, but I just want to step back to something very simple. Now this lower energy that wouldn't get over the hill otherwise can get over the hill if we have a catalyst that basically is changing the amount of energy that's needed to go from this side to that side. So what the catalyst is doing is it's moving the goalposts. It's saying you no longer have to have this amount of energy to get over there. You can have this energy, and then it's cool. Of course, it changes the rate of the reaction. Um, we, I, I've heard an interesting question yesterday from some of the young, young researchers who were at the event. Is temperature a catalyst? I wouldn't ordinarily consider temperature a catalyst in the sense that, um, you know, what what temperature it does is it defines how energies are distributed, right? But if you're only considered, considering the energy relative to EA, then maybe it can be thought of in some systems as a sort of catalyst. But, and we have directed catalysis. Now we're getting more complicated. We have some inputs, A, B, C. You can go on and on. You have some processes. These are spaghetti. Uh, on the other side, you have products. You have energy changes associated with this. You have activation energies going along different routes. What you can do is that, if, like, say, say in stars or TARS, if you're driving the system with huge energies, then it doesn't really matter if you have catalysts. It just doesn't care. Catalysts have no real role in what, what's going to come out of that. The whole thing's just going to burn. And TARS is a, an expression of that sort of outcome. But if available energy is less than the activation energies, then you're going to have the pass with smaller activation energies become more relevant to influence the outcome. You directed catalysis steer systems to particular products by lowering the activation energy along the path to a particular set of outcomes. And that's what I mean by a rigged system. So this is really, really basic stuff, but maybe it helps to bring some of the students up to some basic concepts. I think that life becomes possible when directed catalysis enables coding of information. It's the marriage of catalysis with information and coding that seems to be the main characteristic of what life does, especially when we think about proteins and what they're capable of doing. Does a similar mechanism enable individualistic life histories of planets? Do we also have the same thing happening there? That's the question I'll get into in a minute. Um, when you're talking about planets, you're talking about far from equilibrium systems. Of course, an equilibrium system is one where forward and reverse rates are balanced. Non-equilibrium is one where they're unbalanced. And so we think about rates rather than differences in states. Um, we think about dynamical state as one that manifests particular power and energy, en energy and entropy production rates. Um, we ask, how does a planet system select its dynamical state? I want to ask, is, is hysteresis a catalyst? This is kind of a little bit heretical concept, but um, it's something we often think about in other fields. 
I'm going to define a subcritical dynamical state as one that is sustained only because such a state existed previously. It's like we're going to keep doing things the way we're doing it because we're doing it that way, right? That's a very familiar concept. Um, even though it might not be something we could start from now, we can continue it because we've already been doing it. Um, I'll mention as a couple examples, plate tectonics. Earth could continue to manifest, manifest plate tectonics even if it's no longer capable of starting plate tectonics today. This is an important concept. Geomagnetism. Earth could sustain a magnetic field by dynamo action even if it's no longer capable of starting one from scratch. Now life. Earth could remain inhabited by life even if it is no longer capable of starting life from scratch today. We don't know whether it is or not, but this is. So let's go to a very, very simple example, friction. Everybody remembers from their freshman physics, you have a friction force which opposes a tangential force, say, on a block on a table. And the friction force goes in proportion to the normal force with some proportionality constant mu. And sliding occurs if the tangential force is greater than the frictional resisting force or the ratio of the tangential to the normal force is greater than mu. Now the fun thing here is that mu is higher when there's no sliding, and it's smaller when sliding is occurring. There's two, two dynamical states, it's at rest or at sliding. So let's go through what happens here if we start from rest. We can increase the force, the tangential to normal force ratio. I call this pre-critical, there's no sliding, because we haven't yet reached the static threshold here. But once we reach it, then we have sliding. Then as we increase the tangential to normal force ratio, the sliding increases or, or decreases along some proportionality here. But here's what's fun. Let's decrease this to values less than the static. We still have sliding. And this is what's interesting about this is that here we are at the same tangential to normal force ratio. We did not have sliding. Here we're at the same ratios, but we have sliding because we are already sliding, right? If I were to decrease it smaller, then the dynamic uh, friction can, the resistance gets, gets too large. Then, of course, it stops, and I'll call this post-critical. If we were to follow this in time, this little series of events, we have an increase in the ratio of the tangential to normal force until we get to the static threshold. And then we go super critical, we have sliding. And then we went to, to less than the static threshold and we're still sliding. And then we got below the dynamic threshold and it stopped, okay? And this is a kind of series that I'm gonna show and I'm gonna compare this in a lot of different scenarios. But notice that sliding or at rest is not a one-to-one -one function of the force parameter. For the same value here, you could either be not sliding or sliding, depending on whether you are already sliding or, or, or initially at rest. Windblown sand is a very fun example. Sand is, a, is blown by the wind in several different ways. It can be suspended in the wind, basically turbulently entrained. It can be saltating, which is basically following these arcs above the sand bed, or it can be creeping, which is kind of rolling and hopping just along the bed itself. This is a simulation of this process by Duran et al. This is a really interesting study. What it shows is that these saltating grains actually, are, they're, they're picked up by the wind, they're carried, but they hit the surface and they splash other grains of sand off. Now they're splashing these grains which are both creeping as well as hopping back up in the air and saltating. What was noted in this really famous text, text that goes to 1941, it's really kind of one of the, the Bibles of sedimentary transport, uh, physics of wind blown, blown sand. The occurrence of a steady sand movement at wind speeds so small that the wind alone is incapable of disturbing the surface grains indicate that these, once the saltation is started, are jerked up into the air not by the direct action of the wind, but by the impact of descending grain. So here he plots the grain diameters, and here's the wind speed here and you have two thresholds. The fluid threshold is the wind speed that's necessary to 
start grains moving if they're not already moving. And there's the impact threshold, which is lower than that, which is the threshold at which grains can keep moving because of the splashing effect of other grain. So again, we have this subcritical type of behavior. We can follow the same kind of path. We have pre-critical, we have no movement, so this is the wind speed here now. We get to the fluid threshold, and all of a sudden the sand starts moving, and that's because the grains can be picked up and moved by the wind alone. And then we cross below the through fluid threshold, but the movement continues because the grains are saltating and they're splashing other grains. They're catalyzing each other. They're keeping each other moving. They're self-agitating. And as they go below the impact threshold, then they stop moving. So you have the similar behavior as you did with friction, except here you have, it's a collective effect, all the sand grains working together. Um, Carmen's going to talk more about this topic, but I'll just mention it here because it's really important. Uh, play tectonics. We're here somewhere. This is Tokyo. This is the Kanto Plain here, the largest flat spot in Japan. Um, we have two subduction zones here. We have the, this one. This is the Pacific Plate. This is the Philippines Plate. And this is actually the North American Plate, believe it or not. Uh, the Pacific Plate subducting underneath us here, and the Philippines Plate subducting underneath us here. If you feel an earthquake while you're here, that's why. Um, but plate tectonics is very interesting because it has these boundaries, these shear zones that localize deformation. These areas are moving, we call them plates because they move as quasi-rigid bodies. Most of the deformation is localized to these narrow zones here. And this is again a hysteresis effect. If we go to a plate boundary or a paleoplate boundary and look at what's going on at the rocks, we can see that actually the grains, this is a, these are Micrographs, you can see this is five millimeter scale here. These grains, as you get closer to the shear zone, become smaller and smaller. They're all broken down. And this is, uh, causes a weakening effect, which uh, is responsible for plate boundaries to remember that they're plate boundaries. If a plate boundary forgot tomorrow that it was a plate boundary, then plate tectonics wouldn't exist. It wouldn't be the same thing. So there has to be memory and hysteresis. This is, what, this is a, 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 an experiment performed on the analog material, but you can see what happens if you strain it. This is under cross polars and a microscope. You see the grains being deformed, and then they're starting to break down. And this is something that's happening throughout the rocky part of the Earth. Whenever you deform things, you get this kind of change in the fabric, we call it. And if you let it rest at high temperatures, then diffusion the will cause things to grow back and look more isotropic again eventually. So you have this competition in the planet between the effects of grain uh, fabric, the deformation fabric, and annealing, which uh, determines whether plate tectonics is going to happen or not. So again, we go back to this graph. You might get tired of seeing this, but I'll show it a bunch. Again, we have a pre critical state, maybe in the early Earth, where we're looking at stress in the lithosphere that's generated by planetary dynamics. It increases. We finally get to the place where there's a breaking threshold. The stresses are large enough to break the lithosphere and form a new plate boundary. We have plate tectonics starting up. Then the stresses go down. Perhaps because plate tectonics exists, you have subduction and all these things which are taking away the stress. But you go into a subcritical state where plate tectonic continues. Right? You still have this because you have pre-existing weak zones that are going to accommodate continued plate tectonics-like motion of the lithosphere. Of course, if you go back down beneath what they called the impact threshold for sand motion, you'll get post-critical behavior and eventually stop. Perhaps this is what happened to Mars. Mars could have gone through this complete arc, and today it does not have plate tectonics any longer. But okay, one more example. Dynamos. We think that the magnetic fields in the interiors of planets is produced by convection and electrically conducting metallic fluids. Um, this also exhibits subcritical behavior. We don't know if the Earth has a subcritical dynamo today. We don't know if Earth could start a dynamo on its own if we were to turn off the magnetic field everywhere 
and let it start from scratch. So it could be that this is the state where, where we're in in the, in the core as well, but it's not, it's debated. And again, we follow this, this path here. We have pre-critical, no dynamo. We get to a point where the flow strength is, is great enough to start a dynamo from scratch, and then we can decrease it again. The dynamo continues. So this behavior is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. It's really hard to find a system where it doesn't occur on the Earth. So really what a dynamo or plate tectonics or sand motion or all these other things needs is a kickstart, like a motorcycle. You know, this is kind of intuitive. Motorcycle shouldn't start by itself and start running. Hopefully it doesn't. Maybe in a movie it would do, like a Stephen King movie. But uh, normally we should kick it and get the engine turning over and then that gets it going and that's what allows it to continue. Probably fluctuations are important. So you can imagine that you can have a, a sand dune where sand isn't moving um, and it's not, it, maybe it's in the post-critical state or maybe it would be in, in a subcritical state um, except it never got to this point. But then you have wind gusts or avalanches or other things that could perturb it, they continue kickstarting the process. And so you can have processes which are constantly being pushed into the supercritical regime and then sliding back down in subcritical states. And so fluctuations and these kind of things are really important as well. Like this snake here going along the sand dune, if the wind speed is in the subcritical regime but it's not already saltating, the snake actually could cause it to start moving again. So you have one subcritical process perhaps catalyzing another subcritical process. There's another concept which I'm not going to get too much into because I don't have a whole, whole lot of time, but you can imagine subcriticality of a collective number of systems, of a system of systems, in that sense that this behavior, this manifestation, something that emerges as a product of a system of systems would not happen unless that system were able to get above some critical threshold, but then once collectively some measure of the driving force and energy you're putting into the system decreases, it can still keep going despite uh, being less than the critical state. It might, trying to draw a diagram of the Earth might look like this bowl of spaghetti here, which is why I put the spaghetti. Um, what are the limits of this kind of thing? We should try, actually, we should really try to understand them because it could affect the future habitability of our planet. Speaking of habitability, think about something like metabolic power supply for life. We can have a pre-critical period where there's no life because we just don't have the energy to support anything. And maybe we have to get to some threshold where we're driving chemical systems hard enough that they are able to do the work they need to do to develop the functionality that they need to become uh, biology. I would call this an origin ability threshold. We can't really think about a better word. We've tried to come up with a better word for this, but uh, origin ability. And then once life starts, you can lower this down below the origin ability threshold. And then you're in a region where catalysis allows life to continue, even though perhaps the energy is not available to start it from scratch. So this is, again, another type of thing is will life persist is a question of what came before it as much as anything else. What about tectonics in life? And again, Carmen's going to get more into this in the next talk, so I'm, I'm just going to mention this study, which is kind of interesting. But uh, they propose that sediment, which goes into trenches and subduction zones, can actually lubricate tec plate tectonics by uh, reducing the effective viscosity uh, that this material feels as it slides past each other at the interface. Of course, sediments are going to be affected by biology, you know, particularly erosion from, from continents into trenches is going to be affected by biology. So you can imagine feedbacks like biology into erosion into plate tectonics taking place. 
And then when we step back and look at the big picture, then we see system, the whole planet system, where we have plate tectonics, we have cold lithosphere, which is sinking down through the rocky mantle, taking heat out of the core, causing convection there, which is making a magnetic field. We have plate tectonics, which is helping to re cause resurfacing and volcanism, which maintains redox gradients and other things which are very good for life. Um, at the same time, we have life and volcanism and other things causing changes to the atmosphere, which can, if it stays stable enough, it can actually help keep plate tectonics going. Um, we also have feedbacks from the center of the planet. The magnetic field can actually affect the stability of the atmosphere and evolution of the atmosphere as well. So perhaps this is the kind of collective subcritical state that we're looking at here. Um, so this is, this is kind of where we're going. And, and, you know, of course, we can ask the question, should we call this autocatalytic? Um, it's not catalysis in the traditional chemical definition. But if you think about a product of a series of things, going back and helping out the production of the things that led to it in the first place, then I guess the, the general logic is the same. I just want to say just a little more on habitability. We often focus on the stuff that comprises a planet. We say, does it have chunks, right? Or does it have standing water? What is the, 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 the mineralogy and, and other things? That's one of the elements for sure, because life does need stuff to work. But habitability seems to depend very critically on what the planet does as well. And that's much more difficult for us to predict and understand. Um, in Earth, you know, the only inhabited planet we know has an astonishing number of these interdependencies of subcritical dynamical states. So how are we going to uh, apply this to habitability in a robust way? It's really a tough question. And, and to be honest, this is one of the reasons why a lot of Earth scientists become skeptical of exoplanet studies and habitability questions and whatnot, because it really is that it is very hard to understand even how this planet produced life and how this planet works, to wrap our heads around just one of them, um, let alone these other guys. Doesn't mean we shouldn't stop looking at all these factors and doing this work and piecing it together, but we still have a long ways to go, I think. So that'll be the last slide. All right, we have time for questions. Who wants to have the box tossed in their general direction first? I, I get to ask, uh, ask John questions all hours of the day and night, so uh, you guys, this is your opportunity. You ready? Um, so my question is, when you were talking about the fact that Mars could have at one point had plate tectonics and doesn't now, um, what would, are there things that we could look at on the surface remotely or even once we, you know, as an in-situ measurement that we could make to actually ascertain if that actually could have been? <clears throat> well, I, I think, Joe, yeah, Joe, Joe offered an answer. An answer. <laughs> Yeah, one fingerprint of plate tectonics is are the magnetic stripes on the seafloor. There are magnetic stripes on the Martian surface, but they're much broader scale. And certainly, as soon as they were discovered, there was rampant speculation that that may have been done by an earlier thing. But you know, there's only one magnetometer on Mars, and every damned effort we've tried to get others on have failed. Thank you, NASA. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so I, I think that, you, you know, there's not a unique indicator of plate tectonics necessarily unless you can go to Mars and start looking at where there might have been plate boundaries in the past. I mean, we really don't understand how magnetism is generated in planets in general. There's a lot of paradoxes that are still trying to wrap our heads around. There's a lot of reasons why maybe the Earth 
should not have plate tectonics or should not have magnetism today, but it's, it does anyways. So nature has a lot more degrees of freedom and imagination than we do. And that's one of the things we struggle with. But I think that there's a, there's a seismograph on Mars right now, and that's hopefully going to produce, if there's a good earthquake that allows us to image something inside, it's going to tell us quite a lot about what's going on in the interior. Um, but we have to put multiple lines of evidence together, I think, or send people there to just do a whole bunch of field work. I think that would be the best way. Um, very interesting talk. Thank you. Um, you talk about the role of, of fluctuations. How would that look like in the plate tectonic system? So in terms of metal dynamics and lithosphere dynamics. Yeah. yeah so you know we've we've there's been ideas thrown around. Like one one is that uh, to start plate tectonics, maybe we had impact, right? And the early Earth. Um, of course, that's that's a possibility. Um, there could be a number of different things that happen. Plate tectonics is a really big system, right? So if you're going to kickstart that, you need a really big kick. Um, so I, I don't know. You could have pre-existing structure that comes from the way the Earth was accreted as well. Maybe asymmetries, imbalances, things like that. Um, so there, there could be perturbations out there, but that's, that's one of the biggest ones to try and kickstart, I think. All right. Here you go, Ramsey's name. Okay. So interesting talk. Just a question. Do you have any idea of um, you know what you would think would be a good catalysis or a catalyst actually to uh, encode information DNA? Any ideas on that? Or? To encode information in uh, in DNA. Yeah. So we were you you were mentioning that in passing that maybe you know that's the big challenge is how how does DNA have so much information encoded. In, any ideas on what the catalyst could have been or process? Nope. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's, there's tons of information out there. On a, on a terrestrial planet, it's astonishing. I, I once tried to think about how much information is recorded just in the rocky part of the Earth. And it's, it's mind-boggling. You know, even if you just take the rocks underneath this campus, you know, in the, in maybe go down just a kilometer. You think about all the information that's there in terms of the kinds of grains, the sorting, the sizes, the chemistry, the defects in each little grain, um, the oxidation states and variations and pH. And it's just an enormous amount of information that's there. Uh, and so the question is how to imprint that information and then use it later, right? And um, that's 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 always the hard thing. Yeah, I, I like the analogy with the 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 pre-critical, supercritical, and subcritical um, uh, phases or, or states of a system. The one you use to introduce it with the sand grains. We we know what the y-axis is. It's the velocity, I believe, of the wind. The wind. Yeah. Yeah. What is the y-axis in the arc of life? Is it a no? But is it a chemical potential like the big reservoir of CO two that the atmosphere had, or is it thermal energy mm. or some other form of energy? You see, because you know, it's a the Earth and right. you can view the Earth and the Sun as a as a closed system, and you, know, you can't create energy within that. They can only exchange it. So, what is the think about the second law here? So, what is the? Can you speculate on what the y-axis is? For for life, yeah, yeah. I, I guess there's there's one axis is going to be the met metabolically available energy, right? Right, but that's kind of the a other, chicken and egg thing, as you know. The other <laughs> axis is going to be, I don't know, time. Okay, maybe right. time is the catalyst right. okay. that, that we need to get okay. to get life. Because one of the things we don't know is what happens to organic reactions if we let them go for a billion years, right? Okay, maybe something happens. If you okay. just let it sit there for uh, a million years, okay. 10 million years, okay. maybe a reaction or something happens that uh, we wouldn't have uh, observed in a lab uh, if we, on, on, our, on our lifetime. Hmm. So I don't know. Yeah, very, very, very well. Just, just yeah, step, time, be time patient. Is a, yeah, just, just, just time is a patient, good catalyst, pay, right? <laughs> patient. Okay. All right. That's, yeah. a, that's a very good answer. Thank you. Yeah.
find out. All right, from the Slido, we have a comment about stars. I noticed on, on Twitter, I seem to be uh, going off on uh, railing on the stars, but uh, <clears throat> no, it's just that I'm very pro planet. Uh, you want to uh, address the comment? Yeah. Uh, oh, wait, we have a couple seconds. Yeah, it's not, it's not that the, the, it's not important, that it's not present, I guess. What I mean by that is that catalysis is not shaping the structure of the star and causing it to move in a different direction than it would otherwise go. So I think, I think it's, it's much less important. I mean, a system that has just abundant energy, you know, it doesn't matter if you put little tiny dams in front of it, it just kind of breaks through those. And, and that was the point I was making more, more than anything else. Thank you.